Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through another topical and insightful article from Drug Discovery World. Today's episode is taken from our summer 2017 issue, and is titled UX Design, Maximising the Value of Scientific Software in Life Science R&D. The article was written by Dr. Jennifer Cham and Katrina Costa, both of the European Bioinformatics Institute, EMBL-EBI. So now on to the main article. UX Design. Maximising the Value of Scientific Software in Life Science R&D. Using scientific software can be frustrating and time-consuming, resulting in less productive research. This episode aims to demonstrate that user experience, UX, design, an evidence-based design process that centers on the behaviors and needs of users, offers specific efficiency benefits for life science R&D. Already well-established in other industries, such as retail and finance, UX design holds great unlock potential for scientific software design, because it offers a clear path to differentiating a business and reaping benefits for the discovery pipeline. The authors suggest ways to incorporate it seamlessly into life science R&D. What actually is UX design, and how is it used by R&D organisations? In this episode, we reflect on the latest business reports, and the author's own investigation into the current UX capabilities of nine leading, blue-chip, research-based biopharmaceutical companies. We also introduce a new Pistoia Alliance initiative, User Experience for Life Sciences, which involves around 50 UX design experts from around 16 organisations. The goals of the project are to demonstrate the business value of UX using life science R&D case studies and to provide practical methods to achieve success. Smart science, but not so smart user experience. Leading firms invest in UX, those that don't leave themselves at risk. Imagine hiring the best scientist to solve an extremely complex problem, such as discovering a new drug, but providing them with software that is hard to use, slow and unattractive. It would be like inviting the biggest pop stars to play a huge arena without amplifiers. The science may be cutting edge, but without UX, it will fall flat. The best companies want their scientists to have the most efficient, engaging means to perform their research. Yet, invariably, The experience that many R&D scientists actually encounter in their daily work is subpar, far below their omnichannel, immersive digital experiences outside of work. Companies that invest in UX for their external products may not see the need to do the same for their internal scientific software, which has an impact on the efficiency of their discovery teams. The hidden UX capability of life science R&D. If you're curious about UX and drug discovery, you may find it hard to learn more. When pharmaceutical companies report on UX, they typically focus on external aspects, for example, the application of good UX design for customers, clinical touchpoints, and marketing. However, UX for internal processes goes unremarked. Minding the UX gap in life science R&D. A quote, If you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. Dr. Ralph Speth, CEO of Jaguar Land Rover. A 2015 business research report highlighted that big firms are keen to broadcast their commitment to UX, for example, by announcing their UX spend, UX recruitment drives, such as GE in 2014, and acquisitions of UX agencies, such as Capital One, which acquired Adaptive Path, and BBVA, who acquired Spring Studio. Surprisingly, many of the businesses actively investing in UX, or buying UX firms outright, are not those in creative industries, but instead include financial service companies such as Capital One and Square, technology firms such as Adobe and Salesforce, CRM software, and management consultancies such as Accenture. Even the complex field of rocket science is embracing UX design. Life science businesses may, however, be missing out on this upward trend. The author's research shows that maturity and size of UX capability within biopharmaceutical R&D organisations is hugely varied, from no UX function at all within R&D, to one company deploying 25 FTEs in teams of four sites across three continents. There are no reported examples of acquisition of UX agencies in R&D-based life science companies yet. 
According to 2015 research, the ideal ratio of UX designers to software developers is minimum 1 to 12, and ideally 1 to 4. But this is taking a simpler picture than for biopharmaceutical R&D. A more sensible, realistic ratio may be 2 or 3 per 100 R&D headcount, or a flexible ratio which divides UX capability by project or department. A further recommendation would be to always consider having dedicated UX support when third-party software is to be reviewed for purchase for R&D. Eight of the nine biopharmaceutical companies the authors asked also use external agencies for UX services. They are hired particularly for usability evaluations, so this may be another way to improve the UX ratio at times of peak demand. How life science R&D organizations structure UX functions internally. Even at the ideal ratio, a UX headcount alone will not make life science R&D automatically realize the benefits of UX design. There are three basic options for structuring UX capabilities effectively. One, have a dedicated design team, design studio, internally. Two, have designers distributed throughout the organization, effectively embedding design deep into your operation. Three, a combination of one and two. A hybrid approach of design studio and dispersed designers is best. If designers are embedded, then design thinking lies at the core of one's company, and good design will influence all the decisions that are made. Adding a dedicated design team will create an aspirational place for designers, and importantly, help to attract talented designers. Having an attractive environment is crucial, because hiring skilled UX personnel may not be easy. According to a 2014 survey, UX designer and developer top the list of hard-to-fill roles, with more than 44% of digital experience decision makers saying they had difficulty recruiting them. The author's investigation showed some biopharmaceutical companies may be doing a better job than others at demonstrating UX value internally. This is reflected in the size of the UX teams and the number of years companies have been investing in UX capability. The authors also found that within R&D IT, in-house UX design agencies may be referred to as centers of excellence, competency centers, or user centricity programs. These titles are more suited to the culture of the pharmaceutical industry. Seven of the nine companies the authors surveyed reported their UX capability directly overlaps with business analysis. Supporting comments from leadership include we have 12 usability experts for experience exchange throughout the organization, and we practice democratizing UX via champions in user-facing groups, and actively support projects with any UX involvement. One company described having a specific role for strategic integration of UX into R&D. Scientists turned UX designers, or UX designers turned scientists. Few UX professionals have a scientific background. They are far more likely to have a background in psychology, human-computer interaction, HCI, technology, cognitive science, human factors, engineering, or design education. University programs and professional membership bodies now bolster the profession. A lack of scientific training allows UX designers to ask questions without restricted thought patterns, sometimes called the curse of knowledge. Designers do need enthusiasm for science, and require the ability to tweak standard UX design approaches to accommodate biological data complexity. An example is canvas sort, a variant of standard card sorting, applied to complex enzyme data at EMBL EBI. Rare scientist-turned-UX specialists make ideal candidates. Their background knowledge and intuitive grasp of practical R&D challenges offer distinct advantages when designing usability testing scenarios and tasks. This is particularly true if they are familiar with the types of data being used, as they can create realistic usability tests, for example. For researchers seeking a career change without leaving science, it is well worth exploring UX design as a profession. Life science research is constantly changing, and new technologies, for example CRISPR, RNA sequencing, next generation sequencing, are increasingly available. All UX specialists, regardless of their background, need to keep up to date through continued professional training in the life science field. Scope of UX work in life science R&D 
UX design for life science R&D serves internal research scientists users first, with the main goal of facilitating data analysis and visualization. However, the nine companies the authors reviewed reported that UX teams can also be tasked with delivering projects for enterprise-wide internal processes, for example, compound registration systems, reporting, collaboration, supply chain, manufacturing, and business intelligence, and external products. One company said, We work on a variety of colleague-facing, scientist-facing, healthcare professional, HCP-facing, and patient-facing digital tools, anything from our corporate intranet site to connected self-medication devices. UX is also important for business-to-business, B2B, scientific software. Criticisms levelled at purchased IT systems often centre on poor engagement, adoption and acceptance by internal users, i.e. scientists. UX design software solutions, however, focus on the tasks and context of scientific work. This emphasis vastly improves uptake and accordingly return on investment over traditional systems analysis and off-the-shelf procurement approaches, which follow a more linear process of gathering requirements and carrying out acceptance testing. Six of the 16 member companies in the Pistoia Alliance UXLS project team are research technology vendors. They showcase the potential of UX design to support scientific software suppliers, with one company, for example, making usability an integral part of our development and software selection processes. What do UX designers do? Effective UX design stems from the judicious engagement of skilled UX practitioners, melding their work with the rest of the R&D operation. It requires thorough insights into the behaviours and needs of its target users. The central dogma of UX design is cyclical iterations of discovery, design and testing. UX design is an approach to be embraced by everyone in product or service design teams, not just a series of tasks to be carried out by a team of UX wizards. Experts from different fields must share an approach to solving design problems that prioritises the user's needs. This results in greater buy-in, which leads to higher satisfaction with the end result. Like science, UX is a way of thinking. UX researchers and designers must fully understand the challenges faced by scientists. For example, they need insight into the barriers to exploring new scientific ideas, problems in the physical environment where a device is used, stop and start disruption due to lack of integration in tools, data and workflows, and myriad issues with sharing their work with others. UX research helps inform the right design decisions early, enabling software coders to create useful products and features, and avoiding costly reworking. During the design phase, the new product is envisioned, and measures for success are planned. By using hypothesis statements, requirements can be turned into tests for determining if the product has been successful. For example, we believe this business outcome will be achieved if these users successfully attain this user outcome with this feature. Specific UX techniques are then employed to evaluate and test what has been designed with real users as early as possible. This increases engagement rates and uptake of new tools because the product hasn't been shoehorned into an existing process. Instead, it dovetails with good design decisions along the way. Challenges for venturing further into UX for life science R&D. It is possible for the drug discovery operation to become truly UX design capable, but there are a few specific hurdles in this environment. Firstly, poor awareness of the role of UX design in life science R&D. When UX design is new to an organization, there can be misconceptions about what it is and how it benefits the business. If senior decision makers in the organization do not value it, it will not garner the attention it needs. UX design may be perceived as an idea-generating exercise rather than a problem-solving approach. Staff may mistakenly assume that UX and user interface, UI, are the same thing. UX may be seen as something done at the end of software development rather than a lifecycle process. The UX team may only be asked for comments post-interface design, coming back with a short critical report, stifling any future collaboration. In reality, UX is about the arrow hitting its target, it is not about how beautiful the arrow looks. This message needs to be communicated and internalised. Secondly, 
stakeholder buy-in for UX in life science R&D. Managers must realise that the design of products and services for internal R&D scientists is business critical. Good design must be incorporated into everyday processes of R&D, alongside project management, business analysis and operations management. Evidence gained in UX research should influence decision making and override existing norms. This can be a challenge for entrenched leadership. Managers should undertake a UX capabilities assessment to independently gauge their organization's UX maturity. Questions to ask include, is UX considered in horizon planning? Is there a budget for UX when a new solution is being developed, an existing one is being redesigned, or a new IT solution procured? And next, creating the right organizational culture for UX in life science R&D. Life science R&D IT is generally regarded as a cost center rather than an important opportunity to add business value and to differentiate. This mindset may also explain why UX has been overlooked in life science R&D. It is rare for designers to rise up the echelons of senior management. For UX to have influence, leaders must have already witnessed the value added by good design. In other words, they must be design evangelized. UX must influence strategy in life science R&D. Unlike business strategists who are good at spotting business opportunities, influencing decision makers and building a business case, UX designers tend to focus on people-centered issues such as empathy and engagement. These have substantial impact, but are more difficult to demonstrate and quantify. As a result, UX directly may not be a great tool for influencing senior decision makers. UX is perhaps more heart compared to other business functions that are more head. UX education for the enterprise. So how can you raise awareness of UX within a life science R&D company? The authors have encountered specific initiatives in their investigations that make a difference. Firstly, in-house UX toolkits empower non-experts to carry out UX work themselves, so they see the benefits in their own projects. Seven of the nine companies the authors researched also offer an internal UX coaching kit for their colleagues, including a UX playbook, usability guides, tools, templates, guidelines, examples, and style guides. Secondly, one of the nine companies mentioned using case studies of success stories of applying UX internally and externally. And thirdly, dedicated UX training programs for R&D IT staff are in place in some of the companies, with one having dedicated online training modules. Return on UX investment. Economist Edwards Deming famously said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. However, he also said, there are many things that cannot be measured and still must be managed. Much more than managing what you can measure is needed to manage organizations well. UX teams are very familiar with this paradox. Another recent article states more specifically, Executives want to know the ROI for the products and solutions their company creates or buys. They typically want to know the ROI for UX efforts too. However, a product's UX is so pervasive that trying to determine isolated UX metrics is futile. It can be tricky to identify the exact underlying problem UX is trying to solve, and doubly challenging to measure if the UX has been successful. What are life science companies currently doing to measure UX impact? The authors ask the nine companies how they quantify the success of UX in their R&D business. Many of them use specific tools to assess user satisfaction, including a system usability scale, SUS, a quick and dirty yet reliable tool for measuring usability. It comprises a 10 item questionnaire with five responses options. Net promoter score, NPS, Voice of the user, surveys. How well products and services compare with customer expectations, for example via customer satisfaction methodology, task completion rates, or having another project-specific metric or KPI. And finally, a joyfulness six-question survey, which polls every six months. Qualitative methods may also be used to measure the quality of the user experience. A specific approach is the HART framework, which provides a comprehensive, project-specific approach to measuring UX success, balancing user satisfaction with adoption, engagement, and task success. 
The companies also mentioned less tangible UX yardsticks, including measuring the internal demand trend, tracking expansion of UX services over time, and carrying out direct user feedback sessions. Only one company said it did not measure UX performance per se, rather overall system success. These measures help make the business case for UX. The data sample shows that in the past few years, life science R&D companies have invested more into their UX capability. However, the ratio of UX headcounts to total staff is probably still too small to make a real impact. If more meaningful metrics for managers were available, wider adoption and investment in UX would be more likely. The authors did not see a specific role for an analytics or metric specialist in the UX teams they investigated. It may be an assumed skill of the UX designer, or it may be a missed opportunity. User experience for life sciences. Pistoia Alliance fills the gap. The Pistoia Alliance, PA, is a global, not-for-profit consortium of life science companies, technology, product and service providers, publishers and academic groups that work together to lower barriers to innovation in life science R&D. The Pistoia Alliance projects transform R&D innovation through pre-competitive collaboration to identify root causes of R&D inefficiencies. In January 2017, the Pistoia Alliance launched a project involving 50 UX design experts from 16 member organisations, including pharmaceutical, agri-food, life science and technology companies. The User Experience for Life Sciences, UXLS, initiative aims to communicate the value of UX in life science R&D. Using shared knowledge and best practice, the project partners are also developing a UX toolkit with R&D-specific case studies, methods and business metrics. Nurturing the UX network in the life sciences. A workshop helped forge this new community by exploring and articulating the shared challenges of UX practice in life science R&D. It's exciting to get to know so many UX professionals and practitioners from many different pharma companies and vendors, says Pat Keller, Global Head of User Experience at Novartis, NIBR Informatics. Face-to-face -face meetings mean that we can work together to create a better place for UX in life science. Everybody is passionate, everybody wants to improve the industry, and that's what gives this group momentum, inspiration, and motivation to achieve its goals. Providing a UX toolkit for life science R&D. Each project team member, coordinated by a PA project manager, is working on a pro bono basis to deliver the free online UX toolkit, positioned to help improve the quality and usability of scientific software. By sharing their deep knowledge of UX, gained in the field of life science R&D, they will help others foster UX best practices in their own companies. The new toolkit will benefit organisations with a UX team of one and those with much larger UX departments. In the project's next phase, partners will develop UX metrics to help users measure and communicate the impact of their work. There are two main benefits of this toolkit. One, it supports cultural change in research organisations where UX design is undervalued. And two, it provides practical support, helping UX professionals understand how research scientists work so they can help create better digital experiences. The toolkit is targeted at UX practitioners, business analysts, software developers, and managers of technical delivery teams. The Pistoia Alliance, new UX opportunities in R&D. There are clear opportunities for pre-competitive UX projects in life science R&D. For example, improving the UX of clinical trials, where many companies suffer the effects of poor patient engagement. UX mapping from both patient and caregiver perspectives could help reduce attrition rates and improve patient compliance. UX research and design could also greatly improve product development in a range of R&D settings, including patient consent solutions and laboratories of the future. This article was written by Dr. Jennifer Cham and Katrina Costa. Dr. Jennifer A. Cham is Lead Experience Analyst at the European Bioinformatics Institute, EMBL-EBI. She has an engineering doctorate in bioinformatics from Cranfield University in the UK and has previously worked in product development in pharmaceutical R&D at Merck and GSK. Jenny is interested in UX strategy and design leadership, especially in complex data domains. Katrina Costa 
is Senior Scientific Engagement Officer at the European Bioinformatics Institute, EMBL EBI. She has an MA in Biology and an MSc in Science Communication from Imperial College, and has previously worked at BBSRC. Katrina is interested in translating science to a wide audience and has helped facilitate UX research. If you've enjoyed this episode and want more from Drug Discovery World, then you can subscribe to the journal and get the latest issues delivered to you via post or digitally completely free. So head to ddw-online.com and you can subscribe there, as well as read all of our other articles and transcripts. The next issue is due to come out shortly, so if you want to read that, you'll need to register. We also have all the original full PDFs of past articles, including the one in this episode, in our PDF archive. If you've enjoyed the podcast, then please do leave us a review and subscribe so you get the latest episodes. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you in the next episode.